Welcome to the Camtasia presentation for week two, water quality, where I have 23 slides to talk about um, the legal framework for how water quality management occurs today. Um, so this is basically the two branches of our U.S. Congress who work together to produce legislation ideally to serve the best interests of the U.S. population. Um, what we're going to talk about is what water quality means. These federal laws, which are primarily the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act, go into more detail on the Clean Water Act, and the current status of water in the U.S., and then br touch very briefly on water quantity law. So how would you define good water quality? What is quality water? Is it bottled mineral water? Is it distilled water or disinfected water? Um, so with distilled water, all of the minerals have been taken out. Disinfected water, all the microbes have been taken out. With mineral water, it's actually legally required to have 250 milligrams per liter of minerals in there or salt in there to be labeled that way. What about a uh, pH of water, a neutral pH of seven? Does that inst uh, signify quality water, or what about water that has low calcium and magnesium, or low hardness? Well, the answer is that we can't speak to this question unless we have a beneficial use. Water quality is a subjective term, and every different use is going to have different requirements. And so drinking mineral water might be very appropriate. Distilled water, people might not enjoy the taste because um, the calcium and magnesium and other minerals can um, afford a taste to the water that we might like. And so slightly hard water might be better for drinking and taste good. We would want disinfected water for drinking. Um, whereas for washing a car, we probably don't care as much about whether or not the water is disinfected, um, but we might not want high levels of hardness because that then could leave spots on the car. Similarly, for industrial use, um, they may or may not care whether or not there are some microbes in there, but they may care very much about the hardness of the water and scaling on their equipment, or the pH may be very important because they may care about whether or not things stay in solution um, or whether or not they're going to corrode their pipes, and all of that has to do with the pH and the chemistry of the water. But so. The bottom line is that water quality is a subjective term and we can't talk about quality without talking about a beneficial use. So the roots of, the, of water quality law in the United States are, we can look to the Cuyahoga River for a strong example of where this came from. Made famous by a Time Magazine article in 1969 as the river that oozes rather than flows, this river actually caught fire a number of times in the 50s and 60s before this article from so many, so much um, pollution floating on the surface from wood mills and industry that they actually couldn't put the fire out. And as a result of that, in 1972, legislation was passed which was amended in, 90, in 77 to become the Clean Water Act, which basically set forth goals to make the nation's waters fishable and swimmable. This law, along with the Safe Drinking Water Act, is administered by the EPA, which was created about the same time. The Safe Drinking Water Act the, had two big components. The first was to set water quality standards for drink, public drinking water supplies, and then it was amended later to... So the water quality standards required that public water providers treat the, the water to meet the, the water quality standards. And then later, in 86 and, 80 and, 90, and 96, a source water protection component was, was added so that there was a second line of defense. It wasn't just being, uh, quality wasn't just being addressed at the treatment plant, but they also tried to look at the source areas and afford some protection to where that water was coming from. So, um, focusing just quickly on the Safe Drinking Water Act, the maximum contaminant levels are these water quality standards we were talking about. So primary stand standards or primary MCLs are those where health, there are health concerns associated with the parameters. So this would be things like arsenic or nitrate or chlorination disinfection byproducts. 
Um, as opposed to secondary MCLs, which are those that pose an aesthetic impairment. So maybe things like smell or taste of the water, which don't cause a health issue but could make it um, unpleasant to drink. Um, these maximum contaminant level goals are um, basically indicate a balance between treating water and the cost, that the health benefits or costs of drinking contaminated water, but the cost that it takes to actually remove the contaminants from the water. So while arsenic, for instance, has been um, documented to cause health problems at even very low concentrations, it is not e economically feasible for public water supplies to remove all arsenic from drinking water. It's too expensive. So the contaminant level goal for arsenic has been set at zero, um, but the health, the, the water quality standard, or the MCL, has been set at 10 parts per billion. And this is uh, the necessary balance struck between um, cost and uh, risk. And so uh, public water supplies, again, are forced to meet these quality requirements under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And it's important to note, however, that MCLs are not legally binding for private wells. So whereas a big portion of the United States gets their drinking water from private wells, um, the MCL health implications are um, appropriate for those folks to consider, but there is, it's not legally binding. And to that end, I want to just put this um, water quality interpretive tool up because so many people do rely on private wells. And this is a tool that regional partners have put together um, to where people can go in and select the state that they're in and, key, and the water use they're interested in and key in the results from a lab analysis and get interpretation about the suitability of the, of the water for different uses. So I just want to put that up for people as a possible tool, and there is the, the URL. So the Clean Water Act has five sections that are very important for us to know about. Um, section 404 with wetlands, um, the impaired water bodies list, point sources, non-point sources, and then the synthesis report to Congress. We'll walk through these. So Section 404, or wetland protection, is um, administered by the Army Corps of Engineers, so permits are required for filling of wetlands. This is um, this map depicts the percent loss of wetlands between seven, the 1780s and the 1980s, so staggering losses of wetlands across the United States, with California and Ohio having lost more than 90% of their wetlands. And this is a dire picture because of the number of critical services that wetlands provide um, in our watersheds. And perhaps a bit ironic that the Army Corps of Engineers administers the 404 permitting program because bet between the Army Corps and Bureau of Reclamation, um, the U.S. government systematically reclaimed, if you will, wetlands across the U.S. for other uses by draining or filling them or submerging them under dams. And so now uh, this entity that uh, was responsible for so much wetland destruction is is a uh, administering the permitting system to try and protect what we do have left. Um, it's important to talk about this concept of primacy or the state authority to administer federal law. So the Clean Water Act is a federal law, but we have state agencies across the U.S. which are the, those that typically administer it. And so primacy is the federal government giving the state authority to administer a federal law. And basically what this requires is that the state pass laws that are at least as rigorous as the federal laws and that they have the capacity to enforce them. And then the federal government, the EPA in this case, can, um, can, can, can delegate primacy to the state or to, the, to a tribe or um, another sovereign entity to administer the Clean Water Act. Um, another example, so an example here, if you're interested in looking at more uh, detail there, is the Safe Drinking Water Act, an overview of primacy for states um, administering public water supplies. But this is important because point sources are dealt with with um, a permitting program. And so in Montana, for instance, we have the, uh, uh, the state water quality law, which is the Montana Clean Water Act, 
and um, point sources are dealt with under a the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES. In Montana, this N is replaced with an M because we have the Montana Pollution Discharge Elimination System. And this is basically a permitting system for point sources. And so what is a point source? The classic definition is uh, we conceptualize it by thinking of a pipe. And so this is a pipe that has got flow coming into a stream and there's contaminant in there and we can sample up and downstream and sample what's coming out of the pipe and understand what the uh, amount of pollutant that that source is putting into the water. It's easy to quantify that way. And then we can follow that pipe up to its source and we can, and there's an entity there. There's either an industrial um, plant or a wastewater treatment plant or there's something that is a discrete group of people that's incorporated that we can um, ha assign a permit to and if they um, and require them to decrease the amount of pollution that they're putting in the stream and if they don't do it then we can find them and <clears throat> this is so point sources were dealt with first under the Clean Water Act in the 1970s and dramatic in improvements in water quality happened across the United States as a result of that in so this is dealt with again in a leak under a legal framework with permits and some amount of teeth behind that um, permitting system. In contrast, non-point source pollution or Section 319 is dispersed across the landscape. So in this aerial image, we have a variety of land uses, any one of which or all of which can contribute to non-point source pollution. So these are things like. Um, <clears throat> dispersed livestock grazing or application of fertilizer on farm fields or um, septic systems perhaps and uh, these are things that are dispersed across space and are hard to, to uh, clue in on where they're going to be coming into the stream and so septic systems people often think of those as point, si point sources but they are not because it's actually a dispersed um, recharge to groundwater that's occurring under them and figuring out where exactly they come into a stream is is challenging. Similarly for these other uses and for roads um, and for here we have run off, run off off of an urban street which actually is an interesting hybrid between non-point and point sources. Here we see a classic non-point source type situation that's dispersed across the landscape but then it flows into this drain right here where it goes into a pipe which dumps into the stream, then it looks more like a classic point source coming out of that pipe. So non-point sources, in contrast to point sources, involve everyone that lives in a watershed. And these are dealt with under the Clean Water Act under a voluntary framework. There are not the teeth behind this like there are with the permitting system for point sources. Another challenge is that non-point source pollution often occurs in relation to precipitation events. This means that in order to understand what's going down those drains, you have to be out there when runoff is happening, and these precipitation events don't always happen at convenient times, and they can be flashy and just hard to quantify. So in contrast to a point source where you can go up and downstream and quantify the pollution very easily and then associate it with a, a, a person who, or an entity that's responsible and permit them, non-point sources are involve everyone that lives in a watershed, are spread out through space and spread out, spread out through time and hard to quantify. So those are important distinctions between non-point non and point source pollution. Um, the, so Section 303D of the Clean Water Act is the impaired waters list. Um, so in Montana, for example, um, the DEQ has divided the state into about a thousand different assessment units um, and then looked at those for different pollutants or parameters, which might include nitrogen, arsenic, E. coli. So they have then looked at those different sections and what the beneficial uses are and whether or not the beneficial uses based on nitrogen, for example, are being, are being met. And one thing that we can observe here is that there are more miles that are designated to be 
for the beneficial use of aquatic life than there are for drinking water. And this is an indication that we know that not all stream miles in Montana are appropriate for drinking water, and they, and they never have been. Um, similarly for agriculture, there are portions of Montana that just aren't appropriate for agricultural water use because they're too salty, perhaps. And so that's one thing to take away from this table. Another is that the proportion or the miles of streams that are fully supporting the beneficial use for aquatic life are far fewer than those that are fully supporting for these other uses. And this is an indication that aquatic life often are the most sensitive to pollution because they spend all of their time in the water and so the, the water quality standards to fully support an aquatic life beneficial use are often more stringent than those for other uses. So this not supporting column is basically the inverse of the supporting. And then another thing to take away here is that um, there are a, a, a lot of stream miles that have not been fully assessed. Um, so enter the concept of a total maximum daily load. <clears throat> basically what this, what a total TMDL is, is required under section 303 of the Clean Water Act. And when, so if we have a watershed and we have a variety of types of pollution sources, um, we need to be able to think about them in similar terms. So we've got water flowing out of the watershed and we've got an amount of contaminant in that water from these different sources. But the way that we're gonna quantify that is gonna be very different um, in terms of a pipe that's coming out of a wastewater treatment plant that's very different than storm events that generate these very discrete pollution episodes um, periodically, which is still different from the bank erosion that might only occur at high flows where the banks can be lost. So this concept of the total maximum daily load, the important word here is load. Um, if we are, in contrast to that, if we are an organism in the stream, and we're worried about our health, we, we're going to be experiencing a concentration of arsenic or something in the stream. But if we want to go from thinking about that concentration and making the, meeting that beneficial use, we have to think about all these different sources, and we need to think in terms of a load. So a load is the amount coming off of these different sources, the mass, per time. And so we need to be able to think about, if we're going to think about watershed management, then we need to be able to think about the mass from all these different sources coming into our streams, and so where we should put our management to get the biggest bang for our buck in addressing these pollution sources. So this is borne out in more detail in your homework assignment, thinking about how um, to quantify these different things and get them into the same terms of kilograms per year for a TMDL, watershed planning process. And so the components of this are you need to know the flow and you need to know how much of a contaminant the stream can handle, which you might figure out from reference streams or from modeling, and then you need to set the load limit and figure out what the current load is. So if this stream can handle 473 kilograms per year of sediment before its beneficial uses become impaired, and currently we have 672, kilograms per year going in from these different sources, then we need to reduce by 200. And so the TMDL process is going out and, under, and figuring out what the load is that the stream can handle and what the current load is and how it's distributed among the different sources. Then you go in and um, figure out where you're going to try and get your load reductions. And here, the wastewater treatment plant is our only point source, but its total annual load is less than that that we need to reduce, so we can't do it all with the permitting system. We're going to have to go after voluntary measures for sediment load reduction in this watershed. So thinking about the status of U.S. waters, this 305B report is what the states send to Congress every year, which includes the 303D list of their impaired water bodies, and so those water bodies that are not meeting beneficial use standards and the most recent, at the national level, the EPA combines those together for a, a status of national waters. And the most recent time that was compiled was in 2004. At that point, less than 30% of streams had been assessed. And so 
as of 2004, 28% assessed, um, so these are the only ones that we even know if are, uh, have all the information about whether they're meeting their standards. Of those, more than half were not meeting all their beneficial use standards. So one or more uses in those watersheds was impaired. So thinking about this in terms of pollution types, rivers and streams, the EPA has listed nationally pathogens habitat alterations and organic enrichment as the top ones, and then causes agriculture, hydro modification, or in cases where they, the source is unknown or the activity is unknown. And so thinking about these national level trends, and there, there's more information here at the, at the website indicated here if you want to go take a look for your state at, at where you, your state stands. Um, so looking at one of these examples for, of, of an impairment parameter, nutrients in the U.S. Um, this is a USGS publication um, that we'll get into, and we'll get into nutrients in more depth, but this basically just outlines the fact that we have widespread issues with nutrient contamination in both ground and surface water across the United States, and this highlights some of the hot spots. And so nutrients, one of a number of parameters that are growing issues nationally. And um, we'll, again, we'll look at this in more detail in subsequent sections. So again, reviewing point sources, the permitting system, regulatory framework. In contrast, m most of Montana's impairment today occurs from non-point sources and that's similar across the United States. These two are very different in how they're um, assessed as far as understanding the data and how they're dealt with in a regulatory versus a voluntary framework. And the implications for that are an imp a big need for outreach to foster stewardship. We've got watersheds with streams that run through them and water quality issues coming out of them. And that it's important to engage the public in understanding these issues. You see depicted here citizen science out, um, people out making observations and trying to understand how their activities can affect water quality moving through a watershed. Um, so very briefly on water quantity law, um, in the Western United States, it's the doctrine of prior appropriation that is how the right to use water is allocated. And this is basically a first in time, first in right law, which states that the person who is diverting the water for a beneficial use first has the right to use the water, has the first right to use the water. And so in much of the United States, we have less water than we have people with a right to use the water. And so on the drier years, the people with a, a later priority date don't get to use their water. So those who, again, if you have an, an, an 1890 water right, then you get to use all your water before somebody who has a 1905 water right. And so for a given day, they, um, if there's limited water in a stream, as there is in much of Montana right now, a priority date might be set at 1945, meaning that anyone with a uh, first date of use after 1945 can't use the water. The people, only the people with water rights with allocation dates prior to that can use the water. In contrast, um, in the eastern part of the United States where classically there has been more water, it's based on a riparian water rights system where the right to use the water goes with the land that the water runs through. Um, we also have, call it, we also have interstate uh, agreements. Um, for example, the Colorado River Compact, which is a um, law that was passed, a compact that was passed decreeing what percentage of the flow in the Colorado River these seven states get to use. It's important to note that these allocations were based on much higher flows than we're seeing today, and so the states don't get what they were allocated in the compact. And so sh sharing that uh, scarcity is an important aspect of interstate agreements. Similarly, international treaties are important in a couple of places in the United States. Um, in the Colorado, for instance, um, the Colorado River flows into Mexico, and um, in 1944, the Mexican Water Treaty committed 1.5 million acre feet 
to Mexico. And so that's all I'm going to touch on with water quantity law. It's important to note that the last assessment, national assessment in the U.S. for water availability was completed in 1978. Another assessment is currently underway, um, and this is critical to do because we have changing availability with uh, climate change. And um, this graphic shows that in an assessment of the effects of altered flow on ecological degradation of streams, um, this is that we have in arid regions, um, the more than 50% of streams have minimum flows of less than 25% of that of reference conditions. So this means some streams are going dry that didn't used to go dry. Um, at, in contrast, we do have this 10% of streams or so which have greater minimum flows than they used to. So another type of effect, possibly irrigation augmentation in, in um, the low flow periods. Maybe um, irrigation has increased the minimum flows in some of these streams. Um, again, in the arid area, the maximum flows, more than 50% of streams are seeing maximum flows of less than 25% of reference conditions. Um, under wetter climates, um, we have a lot of streams that have, are, are still at having maximum flows similar to what they've had in the past, but some of the maximum flows have decreased. Um, whereas minimum flows, um, a lot of the minimum flows um, in streams in wetter climates are greater than what they used to be. So perhaps this indicates that water being taken off and used during high flow periods and then returned to the streams during low flow periods. So changing the high flows, reducing high flows and increasing minimum flows, um, both of those can have different ecological effects, which are important to consider.